So thank you very much for this opportunity again. I was here, I think, two years ago or something like this. And Sharon invited me. And of course, I not just came for today from Germany to Australia. I was invited to give some scientific presentations in some hospitals. So I arrived in Perth on Thursday. I went to Melbourne, tomorrow to Sydney, Newcastle, Brisbane, and I'm going to the hospitals where my colleagues are sitting and then we're discussing our treatment results compared to the treatment results from Australia, try to find the critical questions, discuss pro and contra, and as you may expect, there's always not a clear yes or no to one um, question, and this needs to be discussed and we need to work for the strengths and weakness of the one treatment against the other treatment. And that is the reason why we really enjoy to have international guests in Germany and why the other countries invite international guests to their country in order to open the perspectives on all these questions which are uh, in the field. And when I was um, um, two years ago and Sharon um, organized it, she gave me this title and she really motivated me to um, uh, maybe repeat it again because that was, I think, uh, last time a great success when I was um, given this title because bendamustine is a treatment and I will not only talk about this, which came from Germany and somebody um, two years ago made this, it's the best thing, thin sliced bread and I didn't know what this does mean. So I had, <laughs> I was Googling it and I found all the things about sliced bread. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, really I found in the internet since the sliced bread was introduced people did eat more bread so yes it, uh, it increased the consumption of um, sliced bread um, the bread itself the consumption so interestingly um, this was a title but this was just a memory from two years ago um, I'm here to um, um, discuss with you your questions and usually when I do this in Germany I give a few slides um, showing my ideas what is important to know when you treat about um, when you talk about treatment but then I make it up to you to ask questions and I would like to answer all questions up to my best knowledge and to my most confidence what is the best answer sometimes as you will see, I don't know the perfect answer, but of course I um, have a lot of experience. I'm now for 20 years a doctor in Germany treating lymphoma patients and I started my career immediately from the very first day doing clinical studies. And I did some studies with clatribine, flutarabine, rituximab and then later on bendamustin and bendamustin, um, which is um, in the title, the best thing, thin sliced bread, has at least a very interesting history because it was developed more than 50 years ago in the east part of Germany. This was behind the iron wall in the east part and the communistic part. That is the reason why nobody ever had known anything about bendamustin because in the old days, in the Cold War, there was no communication between the two German countries. And after the reunification, the East German doctors told us, maybe use bendamustin in your lymphoma patients. And we were saying, thank you for your recommendation. And the thinking was, no way, we will never use something from the East Bloc country. <laughs> But after a while, we started to use it and we learned it is really very um, good treatment. And then I was the one who um, started a clinical trial, which was on my own initiative. So you may know there are investigator initiated trials. This is made from a clinician. And then there are pharmaceutical driven clinical trials by the pharmaceutical company, mainly with the purpose to have a registration of a new medication. But once the medication is in the market, there are still many questions. How is the dose? How many cycles? Stop early, continue. And this is usually being investigated in an investigator-initiated trial. So I did this trial then and um, we, in 2003. And that was the time when Bendamustin also was introduced into the international community. And uh, as I know from Sharon, Probably many patients here in the room have such a disease like a low-grade or follicular lymphoma. But even if not, I'm very happy and very um, 
um, ready to answer every question from every disease. In Germany, it is like this that I'm, as she said, the director of the clinic for hematology and oncology. And that means in Germany that I see all patients with a malignant disease once they get medication. I'm not a surgeon. I'm not somebody who makes radiotherapy. But once they get treatment in form of a tablet or infusion, which is chemotherapy or targeted treatment, I treat them all. But my scientific focus is on lymphoma. But also I treat leukemia and all other hematological malignancies. So I would like um, to start with um, two slides, and then I show you two or three slides with results. And um, this is what there is a clear consensus in the world, in all countries. And this is for the treatment of patients with indolent lymphomas. All countries more or less agree that you can do a watch and wait period as long as possible, as long as the patient has no symptoms and no severe burden of the disease. Once the disease becomes very large in the body and makes problems, symptoms, pain, or some laboratory abnormalities, we start the treatment. This is under debate always because some doctors may say, no, we start right away. Maybe we have a better chance when you treat immediately when you diagnose a disease. And until now, there is never, ever any evidence that this is better to start an immediate treatment. Therefore, more or less, all people around the world believe when you have the disease and you have no big symptoms and you feel quite OK, you can go on just to have an observation. We call it watch and wait. Sometimes the patient call it watch and worry. It depends on how you explain it. When you explain it that you don't miss anything while you do observation, then it's watch and wait. And it's a good thing because you can extend the time when patient needs a treatment. When it comes to treatment, that means the first two things, watch and wait. We wait until uh, we need the treatment. We combine chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And with immunotherapy, the monoclonal antibody rituximab is um, um, meant. So rituximab is combined with chemotherapy. You also can give rituximab alone. Probably it's not as good as both together. You also can give chemotherapy alone. But this is also not, not as good as you give both things together because these two um, treatments have two different mechanisms of action. So they work synergistically. And there is a new antibody in the field. This is not rituximab, but the next antibody generation, which is called obinotuzumab, or with a trade name Gazaiva. But I know and I learned many times in Australia that it's very critical to talk about things which are not yet approved. It would be not the same in Germany. We are very liberal to say everything. But I have to say, Gesalva or the new antibody after rituximab is not yet available in the Australian market. However, it is available for the refractory patients who have had many treatments before. I believe that is true. So the new antibody can be given to patients who had before some treatments with rituximab. And then, of course, very logical, it makes sense when you need another treatment to exchange the way of treatment to have another antibody, not the same again like rituximab. So that is what I know. And then um, when it comes to the treatment, which kind of chemotherapy, and this is a Benamastin plus rituximab, and I write here is the preferred regimen as in the NCCN guidelines. And NCCN st stands for North uh, um, um, Comprehensive Cancer Network that is more or less North America. Why we are doing um, following the NCCN guidelines? Because they are the most sufficient guidelines renewed three times a year with a lot of experts really having a very critical debate. I know that, that the people meet in America and really try to fight each other as experts what is written in the NCCN guidelines. 
So to my knowledge, this is the best guidelines which shows you how to find the best way. It does not give you every answer because uh, even this guideline does not want you to tell you the last detail. It gives some grade of freedom, but it clearly makes some statement. And the one statement was that bendamustine is the best chemotherapy combined with rituximab. And then we have, when the patients had this treatment, the next option to have rituximab maintenance as consolidation for patients who had some benefit from the treatment. This is also under debate and is being done in many countries in different ways. It means once you have had chemotherapy plus rituximab and the disease went back and you have a good success, what we call a remission, a complete or partial remission, then you can really um, consolidate this kind of achieved success with maintaining the treatment with the antibody. Every two months or every three months, one infusion of the antibody for the duration of two years. This should even improve the treatment results. As always, you remember the coin has two sides, as always. It's not so easy. You can say it's a good thing to do rituximab maintenance, but um, you have um, a pro and a contra. So the pro is you have a longer disease control. You do not need another treatment so soon because the disease is much better under control for a longer time. But of course, what is the most strongest argument is when you not only prolong disease control but the survival expectancy. This is the most important endpoint. And also in our meetings, we're discussing in the end how long are the patients living with that disease. This is, in the end, the most important thing. And also the patients, even if they come to me and they don't want to ask that question by words, they're thinking about it. And I know that many patients think about it. They want to ask me, and they are a little bit shy to ask this critical question. But everybody, of course, is thinking about this. And um, this rituximab maintenance is prolonging disease control. However, unfortunately, in the clinical study which was done, the overall survival was not different between the patients who had the rituximab maintenance or not. Because not having maintenance after chemotherapy is the so-called standard from the last 20 years. So if you want to improve it, you have to make a randomized trial. So 500 patients, chemotherapy plus rituximab and just observation. And 500 patients, rituximab plus maintenance, two years, observation after two years. What is the outcome? Disease control was better. Overall survival, unfortunately, was not different because when the patient have another disease after this first line treatment, you can have a second and third line treatment. And of course, that influenced the outcome in the end, the overall survival to the good side. And then also very new is this one here, the antibody. You may know if you have had some treatment, takes a quite long time, at least three hours. Sometimes patients are used to it and the nurse is making it a little bit faster. So you maybe are finished in two hours. If you want to stress it really to the maximum, you can give it in 90 minutes, but it becomes complicated. So patients really need three hours in average to get the rituximab infusion. In particular, when you go to the maintenance treatment, which only is rituximab, and you just go every two months to the hospital. Maybe you would like to have it shorter just than sitting again for four hours in the hospital just for an infusion. And therefore, the rituximab was developed to be a subcutaneous injection, which only takes 10 minutes. That is a new development. So rituximab can be given in 10 minutes by an injection in the subcutaneous fat tissue of the abdomen. And it was a new development because it is combined with an enzyme, hyaluronidase it's called, 
which makes the tissue here very soft when you make the injection. So therefore you get the 10 milliliter fluid very easily in every fat tissue. Even if you are a very, very slim person, skinny person, you can get it. And that is the new thing. And I um, have done a study with that. Um, this is um, published in the literature. And we asked the patients, what would you prefer? And the patients had four cycles IV. And after that, four cycles sub-Q, or the different way around. Every patient had both ways of administration. And after the eighth cycle, we asked the patient, what was better for you? They cannot tell you from efficacy, because it's the same medication. There is no difference in efficacy. But 83 per patients, 83% said we would prefer subcutaneous rituximab. And guess why? Because they say less time in the clinic. What a surprise, but this was the answer. Second, more comfort, less stressful. Second question also was very important. This question was on my purpose because you know I'm the fan of the two sides of the coin. When you have less time in the clinic, that's the one side of the coin. What is the other side of the coin? Maybe you feel not so much protected because you cannot talk to doctor and to nurses within 10 minutes. Maybe. Maybe you enjoy it sitting there in the treatment room talking with a nurse. Why not? I know that I have very, very experienced and friendly nurses and my patients really love to go when the nurse is on work and they can talk to the nurse and it helps them. So we asked the question, um, have you had enough time with the sub-Q or the IV to talk about your thoughts and problems of your disease? And yes, patients answered yes in both circumstances. Why? Because when you get the sub-Q injection, the nurse has to sit in front of you on a chair and to make the injection slowly over 10 to 12 minutes. When the nurse is sitting there, she cannot stand up because she makes the injection. You can chat to the nurse and you can talk about your problems. It's more or less a more intimate situation because she sits in front of you and only pays attention to you. Maybe that is in the end also giving you the same protection as uh, when the nurse comes during the infusion sometimes to you and is asking, how are you? And then... Hmm? Is that available in Australia, the subcutaneous? It is. It is available, yes. But um, things, to be very honest, nobody is in the room from the official side. <laughs> it has always something to do with pharmacoeconomy and with money. You know, money rules the world. And the infusion system, of course, needs more effort and therefore is being paid by the healthcare system better. sub -Q is short, and when you do a short thing, you don't get the same money. It's very logic. But this is, of course, a challenge for the whole system because the decision intellectually is the same. So I think it's not a fair um, system, but um, it is like it is. And so maybe that is one reason, I don't know exactly, but in Germany, this plays a role for the decision sometimes. But when you want to have it, it's possible, it's fully approved and available. No big thing about it. And then um, you may know this, high dose therapy plus autologous stem cell transplantation. This is also something which is possible even for patients who are 60, 65 or 70 years old if they are in a good general condition, that means you administer very, very high dose treatment with chemotherapy. But this is not recommended at all in the disease low-grade follicular lymphoma and similar diseases. However, in some circumstances, it can be meaningful. This has to be selected individually when patients really have a very bad disease and are young uh, and young enough for this procedure because this is very risky because a high dose chemotherapy has a lot of side effects. So at least you need to be a very good condition and a little bit younger. You would never do it to a 75 person, year old person, but maybe to a fit 70 and at least you would do it to a 50 year old person. So this is a consensus more or less 
there is a general um, agreement. And then we also have some debates, what is um, really um, open as a question, how to treat follicular like grade 3A. Maybe you have not heard this term, 3A, and um, it's a histology classification by the pathologist. And you can have a follicular lymphoma grade 1 and 2, which is a typical one. And when it starts to be a 3, which is not the same like the stage of the disease, but the histological grade, then it becomes complicated and it's rare. But when it's rare, always there's a lot of debates what is the best. And this is no good question. How to improve results when you cannot respond to treatment very good? This is an open question if maybe to change to very experimental drugs or to clinical trials immediately. And then um, is the maintenance treatment um, also meaningful when you have had bendamustin rituximab? That is a very good question because nobody knows this answer. And Australian authority have approved bendamustin rituximab as first line treatment without maintenance. This is a statement of the Australian authority. And CHOP-R and CVPR, the other chemotherapy, shall be given with maintenance. So why is that? Because there is no evidence, no clinical study done with bendamustine, rituximab plus maintenance. That does not mean that it's not good, but we don't know it. And um, the, German, uh, the, the Australian authority has just reflected that piece of knowledge and has said bendamustine rituximab is okay, but not the maintenance. But we still think about it if we can or should use it or not. And this is also what I have already mentioned, the obinotuzumab, the new antibody, Gesaiva, and the question is out there in all countries of the world, is that maybe a better treatment than rituximab. Will that replace in the future the rituximab use? And we are not there yet to know the exact answer, but the answer will come in the next one, two years for sure, because all the clinical studies which have done will now be analyzed and presented to the international community on international meetings. And then we have the new compounds um, and they are more or less a targeted treatment. Targeted means that they are only a, a, a mechanism of action against the cancer cell, not like chemotherapy. Because when you have hair loss, this is because the chemotherapy works against so many cells in the body, even the, the, the healthy cells like hair. And um, the new treatment should only target the cancer cell. But it's not as it is planned. It's not true. Um, the new targeted treatments also have a lot of side effects, which are very new. They are different from chemo, but they are there, and they are very severe and also threatening. So it's not an easy game just to say a new treatment, a modern treatment, is the best treatment. That's not true, as you probably would expect. And the new treatment like this, and this, and this, costs per month 8, 10, 12,000, and the chemotherapy costs maybe 500. So you probably would think, oh, it must be better than you think, which is so expensive. But also, the price does not tell you that this is really an achievement. It's just a new development, new technique of production, new intellectual property behind it. We cannot tell you immediately if the new treatments are really better. This is the names, Edilalisib, Ibrutinib, Venetoclax. I'm using the scientific names, the trade names I even do not know sometimes. And this is lenalidomide or Revlimid, and this will be more or less in one year from now be available. This is a treatment which is known from multiple myeloma, a different disease, a tablet, and always the modern era wants to favor tablets instead of infusion. And so that is a big advantage when you can take a tablet. Personally, I'm not so quite convinced that a tablet by itself is so much better. I mean, when you get six times the infusion in the chemotherapy, I don't know if that is really the big difference instead of continuing a tablet over years. 
because all these tablets are continuous treatments. So I'm not quite sure about that. So, so these are the um, debates. I would like to show you one result. Here you see my name because this is what I have presented. And um, <coughs> um, it is um, the comparison of the treatment bendamast and rituximab against chop rituximab. Maybe chop rituximab is a typical classical treatment which most patients have got. And you see here time to next treatment. That means how long the patient were good enough with the first treatment and when did they need a second treatment. This is a good parameter for the disease control. And this is much better what you see here for the red curve bendamastin rituximab compared to chop rituximab. And bendamastin rituximab is only one chemotherapy bendamastin and chop is as the four letters tell you four medications. So it's interesting that this one treatment appears to be better than the other treatment. But again, when it comes to the overall survival, you see here that there was not such a big difference. Why? Because most patients, when they have had CHOP-R as a first-line treatment and the disease relapsed, came back again, then they received bendamastin rituximab. And then this is, of course, influencing to the good side the overall survival because then you have another very good chance to respond to the treatment. And this is the overall survival and this is therefore important because this is a study which has the longest observation uh, reported in the literature. This is here a month, 144, 14 years, that is the curve. And you see here that the chance of being alive with that disease is 74% after 10 years. So at least this is just the number and this is good to know because so many patients, as I told you, think about this. What is my life expectancy with such a disease? And at least this is the most well-documented long-term outcome of a clinical study. And there would be no rituximab maintenance on any of those graphs? No. This is a study from my in 2003 when no maintenance was given. Why would a doctor then recommend RCHOP over BR? Because RCHOP is for 30 years in the community, Bendamastin rituximab maybe for two years in Australia, for five years in Italy, and it's the only longest experience in Germany. Beyond Germany, it's not so well known for such a long time. So experience, yes, you know? I have done it for 30 years, why should I change? The old human reflex. Yes. Second, um, you feel four treatments is better than one treatment, four medications better than one, and so the skepticism is, oh, I don't believe it. When you give four medications like CHOP, it must be better than one. So the old belief, the old thinking, you know, it's always a great challenge to make a change in the world. And so I don't think that there is any reason to still believe that RCHOP should be the treatment because with RCHOP many side effects occur which are threatening. And the most important thing is, which is from a doctor's side not so important, but from the patient's side absolutely important, when you get bendamastin rituximab you have no hair loss, but with CHOP R you have. I mean, at the moment when you explain it to the patient, it's always very emotional and their patients do not like it. Of course, I can understand. That is the obvious difference. Bendamastin rituximab patients can go, if they want to, to their job and can do and behave as they have no disease, if they're really tough persons. Of course, they feel fatigued, tired, and a little bit exhausted, but they have not a threatening side effects from bendamastin. Also, chop R can make some nerves dizzling in the fingertips. Bendamastin does not, so that's a good thing. And also, chop theoretically could be threatening for the heart because it makes some side effects to the heart muscle in theory, and it happens. Bendamastin has not this side effect. It's not toxic for the heart. So there's a lot of um, advantage for the bendamastin rituximab. This is the trial which I just mentioned, the preference for sub-Q. So the orange here stands for intravenous, four times intravenous, four times sub-Q, 
or the other way around. And at the end of the patients, the patients who are asked what is the best treatment, this I told you, 83% say, I would say sub-Q is better for me than IV. And then this was the question here, why was it? Less time in clinic, less emotional distressing, more comfortable. And this also was um, asked, as I told you, did you have enough time to talk to your nurse and doctor about your illness? So this is the uh, guidelines, as I said, NCCN guidelines. Um, and they are available in the internet for everybody. Everybody can have it, so it's common knowledge. And here you see that they make a preference order and they say to prefer the treatment which stands above and that is bendamustine rituximab. And then you see here on the 2017, which is brand new, they make also here the bendamustine plus obinutuzumab. This is r -chop or CHOP plus obinutuzumab, RCVP or CVP plus obinutuzumab. That is the very latest situation that they add now the new antibody obinutuzumab into the recommendations. However, as a you have to read it very carefully. You see many, many footnotes, A, B, and C, and you have to read it when it's small written. You have to read it. It's very, very important because, as I told you, nothing is so easy when you see it the first time. And there is then in category one, and here nothing. That's all important. Category man, one means statistical evidence is high. When there is no category one, there is no big statistical evidence. This is very important. And here is category 2B, which is lower than 1. And when there is nothing, that is the lowest. And second, here, and this is where it comes back to your relationship to the doctor. This is written in the guideline. In the end, nothing is only evidence. It is personal relationship. What do they see, say? The choice of treatment requires consideration of many factors, including age, comorbidities, future treatment possibilities. Therefore, treatment selection is highly individualized. So NCCN Mike guidelines, and they say in a footnote, everything is free, <laughs> individualized. So that is the point when you talk to your doctor. And when you have a very knowledgeable doctor, he can tell you, I am a person who believes more in this because reason one, two, three. And the other doctor, when you go, maybe you know, second opinion, to go to the next doctor on the other side of the street, he tells you, oh, I would see it different. I would recommend you the other way around. And sometimes when you go to a third opinion, you get a third recommendation. I know it. It is like this. Only in aggressive lymphomas, diffuse large B cell, which is a very aggressive disease, there's one opinion in the world. This is our job for everybody. But in the other diseases, it's never as easy as it is. So therefore, I would like to give it to you now to ask some question if you would like it. <laughs>